All right, today we're talking about strategies for scoring high on a multiple choice test. And I know that everyone wants to do a great job when they're taking any test. So let's jump right in with some things that we can do. Really, when you're looking at taking a multiple choice test, it comes in two parts. There's preparing for the test and taking the test. So what are some things that we can do at the very beginning to get set up to do a fantastic job? Well, number one, I know it sounds really corny, but you need to have a positive psychology. Um, it's not going to help you for you to start studying and to think, man, I'm, I'm really terrible at taking tests and I, I don't know if I can do this. That, it's not helpful. You need to build a positive psychology. And I know that sounds like a simple and corny thing to say, but really when you think positively, studies have shown that you really do start to restructure the pathways of your brain and even the structure of your brain. So you need to start when you're studying and think, all right, I can do this. Think positively. Uh, you really need to find ways for you to enjoy it. One of the things that I do, it sounds silly, but it really helps me, is to pretend that I'm in a movie, like, you know, National Treasure or some movie where they're studying or there's detectives. And I pretend that while I'm studying, I am doing research. And it really does help me because it seems more fun. And that sets up a positive structure in my mind. No matter what you do, nothing is going to overcome not studying very much. So you really need to start looking at the material in advance. You need to prepare, start looking over it, and instead of cramming it all in one night. When you cram overnight, you're not remembering the information. You're just shoving it all in there, and it starts to diffuse out instead of remaining in your brain for a long period of time. And it's just too much, and it adds too much stress. So start studying early. Sleep. Nothing can overcome the importance of sleep because if you cram everything in overnight and then you're tired the next day, that's just like trying to run on decreased capacity. You've got to make sure you sleep. And then eat. Um, again, this is something that seems like maybe it's not a huge deal, but you fuel your body. You fuel your brain by what you eat. You want to make sure you eat a good mix of protein and carbs. And that starts the day before a test and it continues that morning. You don't want to just fill up on sugar in the morning. You want to eat some long-lasting proteins that can carry you through the day and make your body feel good and fuel your brain all day long. When you do those things, preparing for a test, you set yourself up to succeed in advance. And listen to some good music. Again, I know it may seem silly, but when you go in with that good song in your mind and you're feeling good, you have a lot more confidence. Maybe it's some music that um, doesn't have words to it, like a movie soundtrack. That works for me a lot. Now, when we go to take a multiple choice test, we're actually sitting down. Here's some other things that we can do. Relax. And I know that's really hard to comprehend sometimes because we can be so focused on grades and we think that, well, if I don't score high on this test, it's going to affect me down the line and it's going to affect what college I might get into. And I understand. But... You have got to get to a place where you understand that you need to relax, okay? Because in the end, it really just doesn't matter. This is a multiple cho choice test, one time in your life. Um, and a day from now, a week from now, years from now, you are never going to think about this test that you're taking again. In the scope of things, these things just don't matter. A silly test doesn't matter. Of course, I want you to score as high as possible, but taking a test in the scope of life, it doesn't matter at all. So you've got to learn to take a step back. During the test, maybe take a mental break. And I'm dead serious about this. I know we're very crunched for time and it's very stressful, but just see how it feels in the middle of a test when you sit back in your chair a little bit, you kind of take a deep breath and you look around the room and you see everybody studying and working hard. And you take a break. And take a breath. That's helped me because that helps me uh, keep things in reality. Certainly, we want to score high and the best we can on a test, but we also need to take a break, take a breath, and, and let the information come to us instead of trying to force it to come because when we force it, we come up with a block. Answer the questions you know first. Um, and that's helpful. That just builds that positive momentum. So go through the test, answer those questions that you're 100% sure of and you feel confident of so that you're building momentum. And then you can come back and take more time on the questions that you maybe struggle a little bit more with. When you get to a question, 
read the entire question. Make sure you figure out specifically what that question is asking you, and then think in your head before you read the answers what the answer might be. So you will already be thinking about and looking for what the answer might be in the questions. When you get to the questions, read all the answers. I know a lot of the times students will start to read the first couple answer choices and they'll think they see the right answer and they'll circle it and they'll move on. When if they just would have read a couple more and added a few more seconds of thought, they would have seen that the more correct answer was down a little bit further. Usually on a multiple choice test, there's going to be two incorrect answers. I mean completely wrong and you can just notice them obviously and you can just throw them out and know that that's not going to be the right answer. And usually that'll narrow you down to two answers that are more likely to be the ones that are right. So between those two answers that are left, you need to deduct the answer that is more correct. And a lot of the time, those answers are going to both seem right. And it can be very frustrating because in a lot of different scenarios, both those answers could be the right one. So you need to choose the one that's more correct for the answer that the question is specific, specifically as, asking you. And you need to trust your first instinct because what you've studied supposedly a week before the test and taking your time to build up and build that positive thought processes in your mind, you need to trust yourself and you choose the answer that you first think of. Like don't second guess yourself because that tends to get you towards the wrong answer. If you're going back over your test and you know for certain, like 100%, that you chose the wrong answer and you want to change it, okay, if you know 100%. But if you are leaning towards thinking, well, maybe it's this other answer, just leave it. Because studies show that for the most part, your initial answer that you chose through your deductive reasoning and your positive thought processes is going to be right. So let's take a look at some examples here specifically from the test that we just took in AP Human Geography about languages. So if we're taking this multiple choice test, we're going to dig in here. In the development of the English language, both the Angles and the Normans contributed because they A. Spoke Germanic languages. Well, let's think about that. Did the Angles speak a Germanic language? Yes, they did. We talked about that in class and it's in our text. Uh, did the Normans speak a Germanic language? No, they did not. They spoke a Romance language. Um, did the Angles and the Normans invade England? Yes, they both did. We talked about that in class and, and in the text. And the thing about this is you have to know these things. Everything in human geography we're not going to know because what we get tested over sometimes, um, we have to pull from what we do know and apply it to what could be possible. Well, in this specific situation, we discuss these things in class, and it's also directly from our text. So nothing's going to overcome what we don't study. If we do study, we can pull from, from things that we do know to get to the right answer. So we do know that both the Angles and the Normans invaded England. So right now it's looking like B is pretty good. Did both the Angles and the Normans speak languages derived from Latin? Well, the Normans did because that was a Romance language of French, but the Angles, that's not derived from Latin, so it can't be C. And then, did both the Angles and the Normans diffuse English around the world? The answer is no, because both of them only um, remained in Europe. So the only answer it could be is B, and that's why they helped to develop the English language. Next question. What happens when two groups of people who speak the same language move to two different isolated areas for an extended period of time? Their language usually shows very little change over a long period of time. Okay, and so that one starts to sound familiar because we think about Iceland and we talked about how the Icelandic language uh, didn't change very much over time and it wasn't influenced by lots of other people because it was on an island and it was by itself in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So perhaps there's something there with A. B, they immediately develop a literary tradition. <laughs> and I read that I'm like, Okay, cool. Um, literary tradition is written spoken words, but um, what does that have to do with keeping their language over a long period of time? Um, so B is kind of like, uh, okay, maybe it applies, but not really because they should already have a literary tradition within their language anyway, so probably not. 
C, isolation usually results in the differentiation of one language into two. So we think about that, and that starts to make sense. Because um, we're isolated, we've got two different languages, and what happens between two languages when they're isolated? Well, you think about the United States and the UK, and that was only over like 100 or 150 years where we start to see the languages have different dialects. So if we're looking at um, two different languages going to two different places over an extended period of time, then we might think, well, if this is developing over history, then it makes sense that um, these two languages would develop completely different. So C is looking really good to me in my mind. And then D, they lose their linguistic abilities. I'm like, uh, they're going to lose their ability to speak? Um, I don't think so. So we're going to throw out B and D. So what remains is A and C. So A, their language usually shows very little change over a long period of time. Well, what we're talking about is these two languages that have separated, these two groups. Do they show little change over a long period of time? And when we look at different groups of languages that separate, we know that they do start to show lots of changes over a long period of time because they're different from each other. They may have started with the same language, but they're different and they have varying influences, just like we've heard about with the English language, which the United States and, and, and England. If it's an extended period of time, like over history, we're thinking that they will show lots of change. So A can't be correct. So the only one that is correct is C. There's going to be lots of differentiation between these two languages. And over an extended period of time, they're going to develop into two different languages. So it has to be C. In Europe. This is the second most widely spoken language family. Well, we have to know a little bit about language families for this to work. So A, Balto-Slavic. Is this the second most widely spoken language family? We have to know about the Indo-European Indo language family, which for our class, we specifically said you needed to study the Indo-European family all the way down. If you had done that, you would know that Balto-Slavic is not a language family. It's a branch within the Indo-European language family, so it can't be A. Indo-European, that's actually the most widely spoken language in Europe. That family is, so it can't be B, because that's number one. C, Romance. Again, Romance is not a language family. It is a branch within the Indo-European, so it can't be that one. And Uralic. If we did our studies, we can even see the map where the Uralic, Uralic languages are the second most widely spoken language family in Europe. And a lot of that's in Scandinavia, which has been highlighted for us, so we should know that. Why does Africa have so many different languages? Tribal groups that were isolated for thousands of years. Okay, that makes sense, right? We have lots of different languages isolated, and uh, they're not coming together as one language. Multiple invasions by outsiders. Well, um, we didn't study much of that. Sure, there might have been some outsiders coming in, but that would mean that their language would have been primarily spoken, right? So it couldn't be that. C, colonial powers introducing multiple languages. Well, there was definitely colonial powers coming into Africa, but what was the one language they spoke? Mostly English, right? So it wouldn't be multiple languages. And D, frequent migration by the different tribal groups. Well, we didn't really talk about much migration with the tribal groups. They did remain isolated. That's why there's so many different languages, because they weren't all fused into one or a few. So it has to be A. So that's a little look into how we can take multiple choice tests and strategies. Um, if you have any more questions, please shoot me an email, or you can follow me on Twitter, where I do post more videos and information related to education and AP Human Geography. And yes, I did spell my name right. I've spelled my name right for 40 years now. But there's another guy named Andrew Patterson on there that took my Twitter handle before me. And this is the closest one to my name that I liked. So it is Andrew Patterson without the E. Thank you, and I'll talk to you guys again.